Welcome to lesson 81 of Hunger and Thirst for Righteousness. This is spiritual appraisal. Um, it's going to be a really good lesson, as, as they all are. Very enlightening, very uh, um, <clears throat> on-time topics pretty much every time we do these. I'm pretty sure that just as my experience has, has been when it comes to doing the lessons and then being right on time for me, um, I'm sure that these lessons are also right on time for you and your journey when you hear them. So... I'm looking forward to getting into it. So we're in 2 Kings 7, verse 1. It says, Then Elisha said, Listen to the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, Tomorrow about this time a measure of fine flour will be sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. Okay. And so this is a, I mean, there's a whole story behind this part. Now, we are going to use this um, example of one shekel. Fine flour be sold for a shekel, a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel, and two measure of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. Okay, so we're going to use this as an opportunity to talk about these produces because you your ears should sprout up when you hear wheat, when you hear barley. Those are the two the two first promised land produces, the two first promised land produces, and so uh, we're seeing that wheat is well, one measure of wheat is equal to one shekel and two measures of barley is equal to one shekel and now this is during a drought season so they're, they're price prophesying to the price of what when people are, are, are going to gain access to food and what it's going to cost um but we're going to use to talk about spiritual appraisal spiritual appraisal so first corinthians 2 15 it says but he who is spiritual appraises all things and yet he himself is appraised by no one now this is important because what is spiritual appraisal appraisal like people get house appraisals they see how much their house is worth someone that's spiritual assesses the worth of everything someone that is spiritual assesses the worth of everything now this is not something you can do if you do have not been taught spiritual appraisal how do i appraise the worth of what is around me because everything that God created is good and everything that God created has a purpose. Now, some things play a bigger purpose and a bigger role. They have more of a spiritual worth than other things. And that's just reality. That's just reality. And so we have a parable here from Jesus before we hop into this. So we're going to get very, very, very deep in this. It actually shouldn't be too long of a lesson, to be honest with you, but it is going to get pretty deep. So Matthew 25, verse 14 and we're going to go all the way down to verse 28. So let's listen to the parable. So it says, for it's just like a man about to go on a journey who called his own slaves and entrusted his possessions to them. To one, he gave five talents to another two and to another one, each according to his own ability. And he went on his journey. Immediately, the one who, ever, okay, let's stop right there. because I want to explain this as we're going. This is a, a parable about a king of heaven. The king of heaven is just like a man going on a journey. He gave his own slaves and entrusted his possessions to them. To one, he gave five talents. So one, he gave five. So we, we can just, let, let's look at talents, shackles. Let's just use a term that we know uh, or that's common to us. And that's like the penny, okay? Like a small coin, okay? So he gave five coins to one. He gave two coins to another and one coin to another. Each one according to his own ability. So what is he telling you? Everyone does not have the same ability. That's true. He gives according to each one's own ability. Which is why I say to you, if you are judging everyone by the same standard, your judgment is false. Because he gives to each according to their own ability. To one he gave five talents, to another he gave two talents, and to another one each uh, another one another one each according to his own ability. Okay, and he went on his journey. And me, the one who had received the five talents, went and traded with uh, traded with them and gained five more talents. In the same manner, the one who had received the two talents gained two more. But he who received the one talent went away and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. 
Now, after a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. The one who had received five talents came up and brought five more talents, saying, Master, you entrusted five talents to me. See, I have gained five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Enter to, into the joy of your master. Also, the one who had received the two talents came up and said, Master, you entrusted two talents to me. See, I have gained two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You are faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one who also had received the one talent came up and said, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. And I was afraid and went away and hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours. Now, hold on a second. Let's notice something because we're going to get into this in a second. How... No matter how many talents someone was given, so they were given five and they multiplied that by two, so they ended up having ten, or if they had two and multiplied that by two, they have four, they both were given the same response to enter into the your, your master's joy. The same, um, I want to use the same salvation was given. The same reward is given. No matter how many talents you have, you're going to, we all receive the same reward. Now, let's get that straight. Yes, we all have different talents. Yes, there's a, di a difference in my ability and your ability and what you're capable of and what I'm capable of and what God is judging me by and what he's judging you by. That's different. Because, listen, the one that had two, he comes back with four. He still did not have as much as one. the one who with five had in the very beginning. But Yahweh was pleased with him. Why? Because he doubled what he, what he had. But they both received the same response. Well done, good and faithful slave. Enter into the joy of your master. Same response, although uh, a more of a requirement for the five and a less requirement for the two. All right. But his master answered and said to him, you wicked, lazy slave. If you knew that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I scattered no seed, then you ought to have put my money in the bank. And on my arrival, I, I would have received my money back with interest. Therefore, take away the talent from him and give it to the one who has the ten talents. But he said, no, for while you are gathering up the tares. Oh, I'm sorry. Go back up. On the wrong way. All right. So. Actually, family, give me one second. I have one more slide for you. I think that I mistakenly did not put it on here. 29 and 30. Sorry about that. I'll go down here. So Matthew 25, 29 and 30 says, For to everyone who has, more should be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. Throw out the worthless slave into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so what's important to understand about this? Is that everybody is not given the same amount. You have to understand that. If you're going to judge correctly when it comes to people and, and their, 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 their journeys with God, and th this is important. And, and it sounds, you know, if, if you're deep in your flesh, this sounds weird to you to say judge someone's journey with God. If you're not in the flesh and you're in the spirit, you know what I'm saying is that if you are going to be a true disciple of Christ, you have to be able to discern and see clearly where someone is with God. How far they are, how near they are. You, you gotta you have to be able to do that. That's just reality. A disciple of Christ sees as Christ sees. There is no, oh, the, your journey is just between you and God. No, a disciple sees clearly, <laughs> sees clearly the state of your relationship and your journey with God. It's clear. Because we have his word and we know. So that being said, that parable is supposed to help us understand. That not everyone has the same amount. That that foundation should be set inside of you. That listen, we don't. We're, we're not all the same. We're all gonna see receive the same salvation, but our uh, our capabilities are different, and how much God gives us to work with is different. It's different. It's different. Okay. So now we're going to go into this because we're going to look at the differences in people, which we have a, a very great example in the law of God in Leviticus. Give me one second so I can rearrange, rearrange a couple things here.
Okay. We have a great example in Leviticus 27 in the law of God. A great example. And so, actually, I'm, I wish I could see if we could do a split screen deal here. Okay, I was going to read this. So, so verse one, it says this. Again, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, when a man makes a difficult vow, he shall be valued according to your valuation of persons belonging to the to the Lord. So valuation is is, appra is appraisal, it's the same thing. Valuation, appraisal, like what's the worst, what, what's the value? He should be valued according to your valuation of persons that belong to the Lord. If your valuation is of the male from 20 years even to 60 years old, then your valuation should be 50 shekels of silver after the shekel of the sanctuary. Or if it is a female, then your valuation should be 30 shekels. If it be from five years even to 20 years old, then your valuation for the male should be to, should be 20 shekels and for the female 10 shekels. But they are from a, if they are from a month even up to five years old, then your valuation shall be five shekels of silver for the male. And for the female, your valuation shall be three shekels of silver. If they are from 60 years old and upward, if it is a male, then your valuation should be 15 shekels and for the female, 10 shekels. Um, but if he is poorer than your valuation, then he shall be placed before the priest and, and the priest shall value him according to the means of the one who vowed the priest shall value him. So once again, a priest, a minister of God is the one who is chosen to value, to appraise people. You should be appraising them if you are a true priest. If you're a true priest, this is what he's chosen to do. He chose to see the value, not judge. And say, oh, the, like I said, if you really understand appraisal, it is a form of judgment, but it's not a condemnation. It is seeing the value of something. And if you're seeing the value of something, there is nothing that is in the Lord that has zero value. There's nothing. It says even from a month to five years old, there's, an, there's a value. Now, that being said, here is our valuation charts. We look at it again. One month to five years old, male five, a female three. Five years to 20 years old, a male 20, female 10. 20 years to 60 years old, male 50, female 30. 60 plus years old, male 15, female 10. Now, you'll see clearly what these valuations, we'll talk about them in a second. It's deeper than just shackles of silver. It's a parable because as we know, he said he spoke parables to his prophets. He told them after giving the law that they didn't have eyes to see nor ears to hear nor a heart to understand or hard to know. So we know it's not basically about silver. It's not really about, it's not really about this. It's not the price for to buy a, a male or female or a slave at a certain point. It's not what it's about. It's about a spiritual valuation. What is the potential of this person in the spirit and, and their potential value in the spirit? We'll notice that a month to five years old is the least valuable. A male is worth five. A female can be up, worth up to three. True. Now, notice also when we just read that second ago, it said if he is poorer than that valuation, then the priest shall value him. No one will, can ever be worth more than their valuation. They can be worth, they can be worth less than their, their valuation. But these are maxes. These are barriers. We, we did a lesson a second ago called chasms. These are chasms that people cannot cross at certain ages. It's just reality. A month to five years old, a male is five and a female is three. Five years to 20 years old, a male is 20, a female is 10. Uh, we'll, we'll notice that 20 years or 60 years are the prime years of life in God's sight. These are your prime. This is when he expects the most from you. A male 50, a female 30. 60 plus years, it goes back down. It's even less than being from the five years to 20 years uh, standpoint. For a male, he expects more from a male that's five years old to 20 years old than from a male that's 60 plus years old. That's reality. And he expects the same, the same from a female that's five years, 20 years old as a female that is 60 plus years old. That's reality. Now, get into these valuations. This is really how far someone can go in the will of God. Let's get there because I'm going to talk to you about this in a second. 
Now I'm gonna go to the last one first because these these charts that we're looking at. Now I thought I could zoom in on here. Maybe not. Let's see. Yeah, I can zoom in a little bit here. So on these charts, now this is Genesis 2, okay? Little do we know in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, there are actually 50 works of God, 50 works of Elohim that he actually did, things that he did, not things the earth did in response to what he said, not things that Adam did or Adam said, none of those things. Things that only Elohim did in Genesis 1 and 2, there are 50 works of Elohim. There's 50 of them. The last one he did was he brought the wife to the to the man, the woman to the man is his last act, which if you look in Revelation 21 or 22, the last two chapters of the Bible, after we get through Judgment Day, the last thing he does is what? He brings, it says the heavenly Jerusalem is coming down from heaven as a bride adorned for her husband. That is the last deed of God in, in the cycle of being made free. Because 50 is a number of freedom. Jubilee, a jubilee is seven weeks in one day. That is 50 days or seven weeks of years in one year. 50 years. The number 50 is the number of freedom. The number of freedom. And so that being said, this is also why if a female wants to become free, the reality is is that she must have a husband that is journeying towards freedom, that's chosen for freedom, that's able to fulfill his maximum spiritual uh, potential between the ages of 20 and 60. Those, that's the age of marrying. And so... Like I said, this is important because we go back and I want you to look at the, 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 the we're looking at this, we're, we're really focusing in on this 20 to 60 years right now. We see the male that's chosen to go to 50. If you look in the Garden of Eden, who was in the Garden of Eden? It was Adam. Eve would not have been there if it was not for Adam. That is the reality of these spiritual valuations. Is if a woman wants to experience the freedom of, of, of Yahweh, she must bind herself to a man that was chosen for freedom. That was chosen to enter the Garden of Eden. That was chosen to live in that state of the Sabbath and be made free in that in that uh, day, per se. Because we look back on these uh, on this chart right here. Now I'll zoom in for us because we want to see the number thirty specifically. Okay. 30 is the first work of day seven. It says that he is finishing, Elohim is finishing his work. Okay. So this is the last day of the flesh. Is that a woman is, is able to be, is able, has a spiritual potential to be made complete in flesh, but without a head that is chosen to come into the freedom of Yahweh, she, she can never experience that without her submittance to the head. Like, I, like it says, God is the head of Christ, Christ the head of man, and man is the head of woman. The spiritual freedom for a woman from the flesh, because you can be complete and fresh, but completion and freedom are two different things. Completion and freedom are two different things. Complete is that I am able to walk fully in the Ten Commandments of God, fully. I'm able to do it. I can do that. But, but, freedom, freedom is deeper than that. Freedom is being free from Fear and being free from shame and being free from worry, being free from distress. Those are things that are only found on this 50 right here. Because after we get the 50, what does it say? It says, let me go back and I'm going to zoom out for us. Because let's, let's look at this. I'm going to see how you know that freedom is down here. It ain't up there. So you look at this.
Verse 25, it says, and the two of them were naked. The human and his woman were, were, were naked, and they were not ashamed of themselves. They were not ashamed. So that is freedom. That they were not a, they were not ashamed. That was freedom, but it comes after the the fiftieth work. That's the reality. So, I give you this not because we're actually going to get a little bit and uh, uh, go towards a different lane and talk about male and female. But I wanted to give you this to keep further understanding how if you are judging everyone as the same. You are judging wrong. First Peter 3, 7, it says, you husbands in the same way live with your wives in, in an understanding way as with someone weaker since she is a woman and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life so that your prayers will not be hindered. So once again, you husbands in the same way live with your wives in an understanding way. You have to understand an understanding way as with someone weaker. So if you were looking at your wife and you're expecting her to be the same strength as you, have the same obedience as you, have the same ability to be free from from her from her uh you know distresses and all different things as you, you're wrong. The way she finds that co-heir, she's a fellow heir of the grace of life, a fellow heir. Fellow heir. It's through her submittance to you, a free man of God. Now, I want to get into the nitty gritty of this spiritual appraisal we're talking about today. We talk about appraisals in a sense of understanding that not everyone's the same in the parable with Jesus. We talked about the Leviticus 27, how he has different appraisals. For men and women at different in different ages, and that's, that, I think that's that was one of the things that really hit me. there very important is that if you are looking at a sixty plus year old man to have the same spiritual vigor, the same spiritual obedience, the same spiritual eyes, the same spiritual ability, the same uh, if you're looking at that and think that God is requiring as much from them as someone that's twenty to sixty years old, you, you're not judging rightly. But well, Revelation 6, 5 to 6, when he broke the third seal, I heard the living creature saying, come, I looked and behold a black horse and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard something like a voice in the center of the four living creatures saying a quarter of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius and do not damage the oil and the wine. So once again, denarius isn't something that, um, especially if you're in Amer America and even in some of the places I'm, I'm around in. So in Africa, you don't really know what Daenerys is either. So we're just going to go with a coin, okay? So one quart of wheat is, is equal. It costs one coin for one quart of wheat. It costs one coin for three quarts of barley. Now, one thing we're going to notice in this is that barley always requires more for the coin than wheat does. Wheat only requires in this parable it requires one quart for that coin in the parable we saw earlier it said it was one measure of wheat for that for one coin in the parable before we saw it was two measures for that one coin for the barley and we're seeing right here it is three measures three measures or three quarts for that barley now to fully understand why are we talking about wheat and barley in concerns of spiritual valuations? Are we talking about valuing plants? No, we're talking about valuing people. Matthew 13, we're going to go from verse 24 to verse 28. Jesus presented another parable of them saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who, saved good seed in his, who sowed good seed in his field, but while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and bore grain, then the tares became evident also. The slave of the landowner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. He said, An enemy has done this. The slave said to him, Do, do you want us then to go and gather them up? Oh, hold on. 
Actually, one of verse 30. But he said, no, for while you are gathering up the tares, you may uproot the wheat with them. Allow both to go together into the harvest. In the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them up. But gather the wheat into my barn. So obviously we know that he is not talking about the end of age gathering up plants. That's not what he's talking about. We already know that John the Baptist gave the message and said that the wheat he will throw into the barn and the chaff will, will be burned with an unquenchable fire. That is the same thing he's talking about. It's a parable about people. So wheat is a type of person. Barley is also a type of person. In Mark 8, he gives a, a time when he heals a blind man. Mark 8, 23 24, taking the blind man by the hand, he brought him up out of the village and, uh, and after spitting on his eyes and laying his hands on him, he asked him, do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see men for I see them like trees walking around. So once again, this man, when his eyes were open, he began to see men as trees. We have to understand that when you are reading the parables of this Bible, he's talking about different types of people, even trees. Even plants, even produce, these are different types of people. So in Deuteronomy 8, 7, and 9, when he says, For the Lord your God has bring you into a good land, a land of brooks, of water, of fountains and springs, flowing forth in valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey, a land where you eat food without scarcity and which you will not lack anything, a land whose stones are iron, out of, out of whose hills, will, will, uh, hills you can dig copper. Those hills you can dig copper. So once again, he names all these seven produces, wheat, barley, vine, fig tree, pomegranate, olive oil, and honey. Okay. We have to understand these are not, they are produces that come from the ground, but in parable in the spirit, we are talking about different types of people. Which we see the barley when we do these parables and both in the Old Testament and New Testament, the barley always requires more for the same coin than wheat requires. Why? Because it's higher spiritually appraised. Wheat is the first produce and barley is the second produce. Now, well, now, how do we practically see this, though? How do we see clearly wheat, barley, vine? How do I see clearly that someone is this, someone is that? How do, how do I see this? How do I see it? Isaiah eleven two says, For the spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom, understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Okay? So, the fear of the Lord is the first spirit of God. That first spirit of God is associated with wheat. The second spirit of God is not a spirit of knowledge. That's associated with barley. So what is he saying to you? He's trying to tell you that someone who has knowledge, which is very clear to see who actually knows the word of God and who does not know it. Now, I'm not going to say understand it, but do you even know what it says is the question. And I'm not talking about knowledge of the world. Oh, this person can tell me the, the, the this fact and this percentage. And, and I don't want, that's not real knowledge. We're talking about knowledge of the glory of God. That's what we're talking about. The knowledge that's found in the word of God in the face of Christ is knowing who God is. Do you know is the question. You may not understand him. You may not understand his ways, but do you know him? So he made known his ways to Moses. They knew it. Did they understand it? No, but they did know it. So in a sense, someone that is uh, someone that is knowledgeable, that has knowledge, he is going to require more from that person. And that coin we're talking about is a coin of salvation. He requires more for that from that person to be saved than from someone who, who is ignorant and does not know, who just has fear of the Lord. Another discernment. We have now for this very reason also applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. Okay. We have seven fruitful qualities in Christ right here. The first one is moral excellence. The second one, once again, is knowledge. 
So it is possible to be morally excellent, to have a heart that wants to do right, which is the first purpose of God. There is no lesser purpose of God. If you don't have a heart that wants to do right, you don't have anything from God. So in that case, the appraisal will be zero. This is a this is dead. It doesn't even live. But if you have more excellence, like I like I'm saying to you, and you, if or you have knowledge, he is going to require more from that person with knowledge than that person with moral excellence. If I can put it to you practically, someone who has knowledge, God's expecting not only to be knowledgeable but also to be morally excellent along with that knowledge. Because what does it say? It says in in your moral excellence knowledge. So in moral excellence knowledge is is, is put in is inside of it's it's supplied inside of moral excellence. It can't be a part. It's with it. So if I have knowledge, I must also be morally excellent. That, those are two things that Yahweh is charging me with. Now, if I just have moral excellence and I don't have knowledge. He's only charging me with the moral excellence. It may not even be the right. Uh, it may, I mean, honestly, if you don't have knowledge, it's not even going to be the right standard of moral excellence. But do you have a heart that, that desires to do right, that has morals as a sign? I want to do right is the question. Which goes back to the verse in Acts when Peter literally says that he knows that God is not one to show par partiality. And anyone who is willing, uh, uh, what does it say? Anyone that fears God and is willing to do right is welcome to him. He is speaking of fear the Lord and moral excellence. The, the, those two things are equal in the first level. That's the base. You can't be any less than that. But someone who has knowledge is has a little higher spiritual appraisal. They're worth a little bit more. Now, I don't want to say worth a little bit more because there are some layers to this I'm not going to get into today. Because like I said, you're getting the same coin at the end of the day. Same coin. So it's hard to say worth more. But they have higher capability, if that makes sense. So we're going to go into this parable where it says this. Luke 12, 41, and we're going to read down to 48, and we're almost done for the day. Peter said, Lord, are you addressing this parable to us or to everyone else as well? And the Lord said, who then is the faithful and sensible steward whom, whom his master will put in charge of his service to give them their rations at proper times? Blessed is that slave whom his fat master finds doing so when he comes. So what is important about this? You have to understand, he wants. You have to learn valuation if you're going to do this will of God correctly. Why? Because he, you have to learn to ration. Now, I'm sorry, but the people who walk around and, and the only message they have is that Jesus died for your sins. Yeah, well, there ain't nothing to ration with that. <laughs> There's absolutely nothing to ration in that scenario. You don't really have the truth if you don't have some, something to ration. Now, the message that Jesus Christ died from your sins is a rationing. I can ration to someone a day one person. There's a lot of enlightenment on that. You, you would have to have to understand why I'm saying that, because the first appointed time is Passover. And Jesus is that Passover lamb that died on the cross for the sins of the world. So that's something to ration to someone. But if that's the only message you have, you need to see God about give, to give to give you. Under, uh, knowledge and understanding and wisdom to be able to do the will of God. Because if you don't, if you're not thinking to yourself, how much is too much to tell someone? You don't have enough to do the, to do the work of God. But this is very important because he, you have to learn to ration, and, and in order to ration, you got to be able to judge where someone is and how much they can obtain, how much is good for them to have. You can't ration if you're not willing to judge. If this person is in a youthful place, this person is in a higher place, this person is of a higher spiritual valuation, this person is in a lesser spiritual valuation, that this person is wheat or this person is barley or this person is a vine and this person is a fig tree or this person is a pomegranate or this person is olive oil or this person is honey. If you cannot judge those things, you can't do the work of God because you can't ration unless you do those things. 
Truly, I said to you that he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But that slave, if that slave says in his heart, my master will be a long time in coming and begins to beat the slaves, both men and women, and eat and drink and get drunk. The master of that slave will come on a day when he doesn't expect him in an hour he does not know and will cut him in pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers. Now, important to understand. Having a heart too ration and thinking about what, what people need around you <laughs> is important as a worker and a servant of God. Because he says what? He will assign him a place with the unbelievers. You can say you believe, but if you're not really thinking about how to love his flock, you are, are going to the same place as unbelievers. That's what it says. That's what it says. So it's a very important thing about you you taking a conscious mind of what is best of how do I how do I do the work of God in people's lives? How do I ration to these people? How do I praise this person? God, give me eyes to see. And that slave who knew his master's will and did not get ready or act in the court accord with his will will receive many lashes, but the one who did not know and committed deeds worthy of a flogging will receive but few. Now, let's stop right there. No, let's keep going. For everyone who has been given much, much will be required. And to whom they entrusted much of him, they will ask all the more. So this goes back to our whole point the whole time is that the more you have, the more he is requiring of you. Just like he said, there are people who do who know the will of God and there are people who don't know the will of God. This is why you have to be able to judge rightly when you are dealing with people, because we can do the same sins. But guess what? At this point, you have heard everything that God has put inside of me. We haven't heard everything, but you've heard a lot of what God has put inside of me according to his word and about the will of God. I'm sorry, but me deciding to fornicate and you deciding to fornicate are two different judgments in God's eyes. Two different judgments. He knows I know much better. I know, I know. and the same thing for you versus someone else in your life. If you're at this point, he knows how much you know. He knows you know his will. And the thing is, you want to be judged like everyone else and say, oh, we're on the same judgment. No, we're not. We're, we're not. Because of what you know, you are going to be judged more strictly. Because of what you know, because of what you've been given, because of what you have, more will be required of you. But that's something you have to ask God to give you eyes for, to be able to not only rightly appraise yourself, but also to rightly appraise other people to see clearly how much should you be requiring from them? How much should you be teaching them? What, what is the level of what they should be being taught at that time? And so that being said, that's our last slide right there about spiritual appraisal. I hope this was good for you. It's something to really think about. I mean, there's a lot of appraisal points, whether it be from men to women, whether it be to about age, um, whether it be just gen generally um, viewing in the spirit, in the spirit, someone's qualities that they have and the, what you should be requiring of them in their obedience and their walk with God is important if you're going to do the work of God. Because something that it says, I literally just read in Ezekiel 44 this morning, is it was saying that his ministers are chosen to sanctify his Sabbaths. You cannot sanctify something if you cannot assess where it is in the next step it needs to take to become everything that it was chosen to become. You can't. You can't. And so we do tithe and offering MFH Facebook's eight hundred dollars a week to ensure that God's work can and will continue through this ministry. We will then redistribute all collected funds evenly back out to those that gave. We'll be the first to bless you. That's Cash App Money Sign Christ King Way. That's PayPal at MFH Ministry. We'd love for you to be a part of our tithe and offering program. Um, definitely biblically based and everything He wants us to do with that. Um, this was lesson eighty one spiritual appraisal. I hope it was good for you. We we'll back soon with lesson 80, lesson eighty two. Be blessed.